Good afternoon, everyone. I really appreciate the, the invitation and uh, to uh, uh, come up here and uh, talk about uh, what we do. Uh, we are not a plant biology lab, so uh, I'm not really going to talk about anything related to plants. But hopefully, a lot of these uh, approaches and uh, you know methodologies that we're using can be sort of generally applied also to plant biology and sort of can, you know, can stimulate some interesting discussions or even maybe collaborations. Uh, so, you know, you know, I, I, you know, I want to talk about, so today I want to talk about using sort of uh, interactome networks, as uh, Brian introduced, that's what we do, and together with structural information, so this concept of structural interactome networks uh, to dissect complex geotype to phenotype relationships, right? So, in biology, I guess, you know, all of us, like Kelly was just talking about, we're interested in this question of how do we go, especially in the, you know, in, the in this post-genomic era, how do we go from genotype to phenotype, and there's so many different ways of getting there, and for us, of course, we want to go from genotype to networks, and then to phenotype, right? So, you know, because there is an underlying molecular network in every cell of every living organism, and it's the overall output of this network that fundamentally determines the function and the phenotype of the cell, and then collectively the phenotype of all of the cells in the organism determines the phenotype of that organism, or that individual, right? So, and you know, sort of, I think of this like, uh, sort of, you know, if you spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a car, you won't be very happy if I give you this, right? Because I can say, oh, you know, I give you everything for a car, but very few people can put this together in a functional running car, right? And sort of, this is sort of the uh, sort of you know the premise of systems biology is the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? Even if you understand the function, and we're not there, right, you know, to understand the function of every single gene. But even if you understand, you know, you understand the individual parts, let's say, oh, I know how a tire works, right, so it rolls around, it rolls around uh, uh, down the road and minimize the friction. But the question is still, how do you put power, how do you accelerate the, 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 the tire, right? And how do you control it? How do you turn it, right? And how do you stop it, right? So. To understand all of this, you, you, you really have to know what are other parts connected to the tire, how they're connected to it, right? So to really understand the regulation you know, in cells, right? There's the signaling, the regulation, and all of that. And so, you know, this is the idea is that, you know, genomic sequences, like, you know, provides all of the parts, but we really need the network that is the wiring diagram of the cell. Right, so I think it's, of course, sequencing is fundamental, but I, I would argue that we also need the wiring diagram, that is the networks, right? So that if we have that, we can then, uh, you know, map, you know, when we have genotype, we can see uh, how it's gonna affect the network and then lead to the phenotype changes for our lab. We're mostly interested in, you know, how that affect evolution, you know, mutations happen or uh, divergence in the genome happen lead to speciation events, and also really a lot is in sort of uh, cause disease, right? Mutation rewires the network and lead to disease. And uh, so today, you know, I want to talk about two parts. Number one is I, I just really want to use the net, from, from a network point of view to evaluate sort of the functional landscape of genetic variations across human populations. And then secondly, focus on sort of how can we use this kind of structural interactome models and interactome perturbation study frameworks to really prioritize candidate risk mutations and risk variants, specifically in this case, uh, we're studying autism. So the first part, and you know, speaking of population variants, I mean, through all the sequencing effort we've known, and this number always scares me <laughs> to think about this, right? So each of our individual, each of our genomes, compared to the reference genome or compared to unrelated individuals, we have at a minimum five million mutations, okay? So that number just is scary to me because that's set a five million 
potential uh, risk variants that cause this individual to have a devastating disease, right? So the combinatorial effects of all of these five million mutations, really, genetically speaking, fundamentally determines each of us who we are, right? Including our susceptibility to various disease. And I really want to emphasize, even in the distance, you know, for the vast majority of these millions of mutations that we have sequenced, that we have identified today, we have no idea what they do. But even if in the distant future we understand each of the five million mutations, what their functional impact is, that's still far from enough because it's really the combinatorial effects. Right, of the five million. So the complexity is enormous, right? So that's really the bottleneck and the challenge for you know, genetics, right? And, but I would argue that it's also an opportunity for network biology because you really need the network framework to understand the combinatorial effects of these five million mutations in a individual genome, right? So that's really related to the precision medicine initiative. And uh, so, so if you take a look, any of these you know, population variance data, so here I'm using the exact database now, we should really, for human, we should really use the uh, uh, NOMAD, but you know, exact was published a couple years ago, and it sequenced 60,000 people, exomes only, right? So if you look at this, it's a very big data set. And if you look at this, is like any database you go to, or any given population you sequence and you check, it's dominated by super rare variants, right? Over 50% is only showed up in one person out of 60,000, right? So 90% are within 10 people, right? So they're super rare. But so, you know, if, you know, population genetics, you know, if we look at it, think about selection, you know, the theory is that the rare alleles, they're under purifying selection, they can be deleterious, damaging, or functional, whichever word you want to use, right? But common variants really should not be functional. They should, they should just be polymorphisms. They shouldn't have anything. A lot of the prediction methods, like Polyphon 2, I mean, it's really almost 10 years ago, they use all population variants, rare and common, as negative controls. They say, oh, if it's a population variance, it's not going to be functional. And then, you know, recent years like CAD and other methods start to use common variants, but still, common variants are considered basically as, because they can't be, uh, you know, if the many, many normal people are, you know, having these in their genome, they cannot be functional, right? And especially in medical genetics, so if you sequence a patient cohort, trying to find, because, you know, we have a lot of collaborations, you know, to do this, uh, to find the causal mutations in the patient cohort, the first thing that they do is to say, okay, let's go to exact or go to NOMAD, remove any mutation they found that are at least that at one percent frequency or more in the normal population. Right, one percent is 70 million people. I just want to, so it's a lot of people. People say, oh, if 70 million. 70 million normal people having this mutation or, or this variant, it cannot be disease causing, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So that's sort of the assumption, but it's just, you know, really true because on the other hand, if you look at each individual genome, the vast majority of the individual genome, the five million mutations are made up with common variants. So if they are functional, a lot more fraction of each individual genome's mutations are going to be functional. So they have a far more, they're impacting tens, hundreds, millions of people. And in terms of makeup of your individual genome, they also have a lot of impact. So it's very important to really understand to what extent these different variants are going to be functional, right? So we want to do that, right? So we really want to do that, and we're going to do that in terms of how they disrupt protein interaction and protein interaction networks. But, so this plot, the, the yellow or orange bar is just a replotting of the plot that I showed you before. It's, you can say, the exact, you know, uh, dominated by rare. If you look at a database, a collection of these mutations, uh, you know, rares are going to dominate. And that creates a problem. So if you just randomly, a lot of the work we've seen, they just randomly sample mutations from a database, then your data, 99.9% .9 are going to be super rare mutations. It's going to be very unlikely, just by chance, you're going to sample any 
common variance, right? So you're not going to have enough power to do any statistical meaningful, to, do, to draw any statistical meaningful conclusions. And also, if you do random mutagenesis, it's often used, you're going to generate mostly rare mutations or even synthetic mutations that you've just never seen in the human population, right? So to address this question, we decided to do, actually, we select, intentionally we selected about two to 300 mutations across at different allele frequency beans, minor allele frequency beans, including those super common uh, beans, right? So really not randomly selecting. So we did basically 2,000 of those uh, variants. And we chose some, HGMD is a mutation for known these genetic germline mutations in human. And cosmic is the you know, somatic mutations found in cancer, most of which we believe are passenger, right? So these two are used as controls, and you'll see how we're gonna use them. So we, in total, we selected 2,000 variants randomly across the allele frequency beams, and some disease variants, and some cancer somatic mutations. So we basically, uh, you know, generate using, uh, we have a, this technique called the clone seek, so we can generate these thousands of mutation clones, and we use Y2H, to screen uh, all of these uh, you know, over 2,000 protein protein interactions for these 2,000 mutations, their impact on 2,000 interactions, uh, and we did them in tri triplicate. Right? So each we test triplicate and try to see, you know, how you know it affects interactions and the network. And we also developed actually a GFP assay where we can test whether the mutation just completely destabilize the protein or you know the interaction we want to see whether the interaction disruption is specific to a specific interaction or it's just the protein is gone because of the mutation right so we did both the interaction interaction screen and the stability screen so well before I, I I guess I just shows you the result I guess so what is the expectation right so are those common variants going to show going to contain any disruptive alleles, right? Are they going to have any function, especially those super common ones, right? So the expectation should be they shouldn't be that functional. Well, our result, so here is our result. So as you can see, right, clearly, so these are the population variants from super rare to very, very common, right? Larger than 10%, that's 700 million people having these alleles, right? So as you can see, of course, the rare alleles are more disruptive, right? The y-axis is the fraction of disruptive ones based on our measurements, right? So they're really, really, they're disruptive. But the question is, I would have expected a more like an exponential decay and then to the super common ones, basically none of them are disruptive. But as we can see, this drop, and as we've seen in a lot of the you know, pop gen sort of papers, but this drop is a lot slow. The slope of the drop is a lot slower than we have ever seen before. And even for, you know, so 20% of these super rare ones are disruptive. When you go to these super common ones, 10% or more minor allele frequency, still 10% of those, as we measured, are disruptive. And I want to emphasize, we are only looking for disrupting protein-protein interactions. There are many, you know, function is a very broad term, right? So we are really only measuring one aspect of function because it could, there could be a variance that does not disrupt protein-protein protein, protein interaction, but disrupt enzymatic activity, disrupt transcription factor binding to DNA. You know, so this is a very lower bound. So this 10% of the super common variants being disruptive, it's a absolute lower bound estimation, right? So in reality, it could be much higher. So again, so this is very surprising to us. And if you compare to the cancer mutations, as we say, most of them are basically passenger. So they're the same. It's very actually satisfactory to see this. Basically, these cancer mutations uh, basically the same disruption rate as just super rare uh, population variants. Only those that are known unknown cancer genes, they have a higher disruption rate because they're more likely to be driver mutations. And then if you go to these so-called known disease mutations, they have the highest disruption rate. 
And still, it's not 100%. Because again, it's not, you know, they may not disrupt interaction. They may cause enzymatic functional disruptions or other things to cause disease, to affect protein function and cause disease, right? So this really shows that it's a lower bound. Uh, but again, so the first con uh, uh, conclusion that we've seen is that there are many common variants that are functional, right? At least at the molecular level, there are a lot, a lot more than we would have expected from, you know, just so, sort of what we have thought before, you know, thinking about selection, all of that. But, you know, one thing I want to mention is that when we talk about selection, you know, they are selecting mostly on reproductive fitness. So a lot of the even disease interaction, actually we know a lot. So we actually wrote a uh, review last year. There is a lot, a lot, you know, there are a lot of known disease associated mutations that are actually really common, right? So for this APOE mutation, it's almost like 20% of ill frequency. But that's associated with Alzheimer's disease, right? So these are late onset disease, even, it, even though they may be very devastating disease, but their impact on fitness may be minimal. Therefore, they're not under that strong of a selection, right? So, and also we know, I mean, we didn't even put it in here, is the sickle cell anemia mutation. They're 0% in East Asia populations, like my population, but they're 10% at the Central Africa. Right, so because they have the benefit against malaria, right? So you can see, so there can be, so there definitely, we, have, we even know a, a lot of cases where you have very high, you know, 25% uh, related to, again, this is clearly a, a late onset disease, right? Age-related macular uh, degeneration, right? So, so, and once, because we sequence, we, we, uh, sampled each bean and we know how much we sampled, we can then ask a question, right? How many of the missense variants, because we only kind of coding region, are functional, right? And this question, of course, since the beginning of the human genome sequencing, people are interested in this. So 1,000 genomes estimated only one, like less than 2% of the missense variants that we observed in the in individual genome are functional. But of course, all of these, they use some kind of population genetic or computational prediction methods because they don't have any experiments. So based on our experiments, you can see, basically we're tenfold higher than the original 1,000 genome uh, estimation and is higher than any of the other big genome sequencing uh, estimations, right? So we have a lot more uh, disruptive variants in each individual genome, right? Again, I want to mention this is an absolute lower bound estimation because this is only interaction disruption. There are clearly going to be variants that don't disrupt protein per interaction but disrupt other aspects of protein and gene function, right? What this means is that the genetic background in each individual, for each, in each individual, within each person, is actually far more complex than we expected before, right? Because, you know, for instance, we have found about four or 5,000 known disease-related, disease-causing or disease-associated mutations. But the vast majority of these have very limited penetrance. That is, only like maybe 10, 20% of the people having these known disease-causing mutations are actually showing the disease phenotype, right? And geneticists will always say, well, that is because of the genetic background, right? And I think we are really, so what does that mean? What does, I think this is what we mean, right? Is these five million mutations, and a lot of them are actually functional, you know? So I think this is, you know, just to sort of uh, give an example, and, uh, you know, so this is uh, AKR782 is an aldo uh reductase. And it's a key enzyme in the pathway to degrade uh, GABA. It's an inhibitory, it's a very important uh, neurotransmitter. And there is a mutation you can see at almost 10% allele frequency, right? And we show that it disrupts, and we know this enzyme that people have shown that needs to form a homodimer. And you need to be the homodimer to have the enzymatic activity, and we show that it disrupts the homodimer formation. And the protein is stable, so it's only the interaction is no longer. And we cloned this you know, mutation 
and we were able to show from a biochemical assay that it does reduce, even though, again, you can say, oh, this is so high, it's a ten, again, 10%, right? And it does significantly reduce the enzymatic activity of this enzyme, this very common population variance. And again, right, it's, it's in a pathway, in fact, the upstream and downstream enzymes, so this enzyme, you know, this mutation are not known to be related to any disease, but there are known disease mutations uh, upstream and downstream of this enzyme that are related to neurological, devastating neurological disorders. And again, so maybe, and those mutations are not 100% penetrant. And so one, you know, we, we can just, just sort of extrapolate a little bit that maybe those people that have mutations sort of decrease the efficiency of these two enzymes Maybe individually they're okay, but if they also, because 10% chance are really high, if they also have the population variance that, that reduces this efficiency of this enzyme, maybe then you will become disease. You become, uh, you will have a disease, right? So, so that's sort of how we think about the impact of looking at these population variants and how do we use the network to explain their impact, right? So, uh, how much time do I have? So I think I'm. It's almost done. <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> you have a few more minutes. Okay, so let me, I, I can just wrap up this and then we can clearly use this actually. So we and others have shown that by looking at the disruption profile, basically, which interaction, because each protein on average have almost 10 interactions just based on the network that we know today. So, and each mutation only disrupts a small subset of these interactions. By looking at which interaction are disrupted and which interaction are not disrupted, which we call a disruption profile, and we've published this before and other people confirm, that is mutations with matching profiles tend to cause the same disease, right? And we recapitulate this here, right? And then the more matching disruptions they have, the more likely they cause the same disease. And we can use this to actually, I'm gonna skip this example, but this is a work that we've done uh, together with actually John Schimenti's group, which is, uh, you know, so this D197N on this SEPT12 protein, so the SEPT proteins uh, forms a ring-like structure that is key for the mobility of sperms, right? So this D197N is a known mutation on SEPT12 that causes male infertility. And through our uh, screen, we found this population variance and it's rare because it's directly affect uh, fertility, right? But it's still, uh, so this mutation has the same disruption profile. And when we did, this is a homology model that we did, we found that both mutations are on the interface of SEP12 uh, protein interaction, right? So this is just unbelievable. And we tested with the co-IP and we found we confirmed that both mutations, the known disease the known infertility mutation and our population variants disrupt, you know, SEP12 interaction with the other SEP proteins. Here we show SEP1, right? So we collaborated with John's uh, group and they generated CRISPR mice. And they were able to show that specifically the homozygous male mice, not female mice, have really significantly reduced litter size. And in fact, if we look at the uh, sperms, we found, they found that the heterozygous mice have already a reduced mobility, but homozygous is really over the edge, right? The mobility really lowered, right? And that explains why they are, you know, they have small litter sizes. So we found, through our screen, we found a novel male infertility associated population variance, right? They can have immediate, uh, so impact about explaining why certain people maybe have a hard time uh, making babies. So you know our paper just came out last week. So you know if you, you know, there are a lot more results that I, you know I can talk here. You know take a look and we can. I'm happy to talk about. And I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna talk about the second part. I think I'm talking. I'm just gonna talk about sort of in terms of the theme of this conference is integrative, right? So we really want to integrate, as you can see network, uh, 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 protein network models 
with actually really structured models, right? Most of the networks, people have sort of ignored actual structures, right? When they show network, they show this kind of hairball. You have all these different dots that represent different proteins, and there is no structure, right? Each dot is a mathematical point, right? So, but I think that's a, that's a mistake because proteins do have structure and they're fundamental to the protein function and that's what we try to do and we want to use this kind of structural network of models for genomic interpretation and uh, uh, all the different applications and the key is to generate you know large scale models or protein scale models and we actually have generated a full protein scale uh, you know sort of interaction interface prediction for all interactions I think that can be really useful for genomic studies. And I'm just gonna skip over all of this because I don't have time and just go to, go to, uh, <laughs> go to, yeah, I'm not, no summaries either. Yeah, because <laughs> I just finished talking about all of this and, uh, oh, <laughs> went too fast, yeah. So just um, get my uh, sort of the uh, acknowledgement slides. You know, this is my group. The work are done out by the students and postdocs, and we have wonderful collaborators here at Cornell and across the campus and, and, and other places. And our funding resources. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so if I may rephrase the question, so you're saying certain interactions are more dominant? They're more important. Yeah, either it's because the, I don't know, the lifetime of the person, you might have preference for one interaction over another. Yeah. Um, so so I mean, it's hard for, for us to say. So first of all, you know, we really are very careful because there is a lot, I have to say, there's a lot of noise out there in the database that you know may may not be real interactions, right? So we very careful, you know, we don't just take all the database and you know combine together, say, oh, these are all interactions. We select what we call the high quality interaction, the real interactions, if you wish. But in terms of interactions more in important than the other, I guess it's hard to judge. Depends on which pathway you are looking at, right? But what we have seen that that is, you know, I, I didn't have time to talk about here is there is a strong enrichment of mutations at certain interaction interface. In general, at interaction interfaces, but to a certain protein, often it's to a particular interface because again, proteins interact with 10 other proteins and they use many different interfaces. So we do see that. And that, you know, we, we have published that and we are trying to use that to interpret, you know, if there are other mutations uh, in the same interface, maybe those interface, those mutations are going to cause the same disease. So that's how we are doing. So for a given disease, yes, there are certain more important interactions and interaction interfaces. And you can actually see that by looking at the clustering in the spatial, 3D spatial clustering of these mutations in the given interface. And we, we, we can't do that. Yes, please. We tend to talk about this in terms of disease. I mean, there seems to be a lot of variants that might have environmental advantages. You know, um, they're all bad. Yes, for sure. So there isn't like one level that's good and then everything else is worse. But maybe, how much do you know about the sources of the genomes that you can use to correlate with other factors, environmental factors, or you know, geography factors? So that's a good question. So there is a result that I didn't show is we look at all, because we, you know, we screen these 2,000, excellent question actually. So we, you know, we look at 2,000 basically, 2,000 population variants. We did look at you know, where they are in terms of selection. And we did see there is the enrichment of course at an actively selected site for the disruptive variants. But there's also enrichment 
for them to be at the positively selected sites. And those could be beneficial. And uh, so, so that's sort of, you're right. I, I totally agree. They're, they're not, they, they, they may not be all bad. Just like the sickle cell anemia, right? So in, in one hand, they're bad, but they also give you resistance to malaria infections. And they're, that, that's definitely beneficial. And that's why in Central Africa, it's at a 10% allele frequency, whereas in East Asia, it's 0%. You don't see it because, yeah. Yes? Uh, yeah, I guess related maybe to that question. Um, first of all, I thought calling the networks a hairball. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Um, I guess a related question, looking at sort of this from an evolutionary perspective. You know, you see these disruptive variants. They look like they're more common than we really would have thought they would be. But also, I mean, couldn't an evolutionary advantage there be that these are things that are going to take sense, but sort of remove individuals from the population once they've got to an older age, sort of where they're not necessarily, you know, maybe there's a, an evolutionary advantage of sort of getting rid of those parts of the population <laughs> early. That, uh, it's going to be, yeah, that's a dangerous topic to be addressing in a public, uh, no, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's just, you know, that's, you know, your guess, you know, I guess that's up to debate, but I, I think I'm a strong believer in, you know, you know, looking at selection, you know, the, there's not a lot of good methods, right? So often people look at, you know, even for disease mutation, people often just uses these kind of population signatures. But I just want to point out that pop, when you look at these selection uh, signatures, they are looking for basically reproductive fitness, right? Deleterious to uh, reprodu reproductive fitness. Whereas most of the disease, right? Cancer, for example, TCGA, sequencing, all of this, most of them are very late onset. So how, you know, the relationship is not that obvious that, you know, but, you know, I agree. There's a lot of information. I'm not saying you shouldn't use that, but I'm just saying you should be, at least be mindful of this caveat. Well, let's thank Ryan once again. Thank you. Thank you.